Hello, thank you for joining me today. My name is Eric Wallman, humanities professor on the East Campus. I recently made a trip to Norway and Sweden, uh, funded by the Chelsea Magruder Fellowships, which allows humanities professors to study topics of interest and incorporate them into our class. My topic of research began in sort of an unrelated area of study compared to where I ended up and what I studied. My topic of research was the Viking travel from Sweden to Constantinople and eastward. And it's a kind of a strange story on how I got into this topic. I uh, one day was showing students a Renaissance painting. It's the Arnolfini wedding portrait by Jan van Eyck. And the students were doing some study questions and they said, a professor, what made these merchants rich? What allowed them to make this money that allowed them to buy these paintings, which then reflect their daily lives and religious ideologies and such? I was kind of stomped on the question. I didn't really know. And I said, well, you know, they, they definitely traded along the coast of Europe. And then a student said, well, how do they know it was safe to do so? And I said, well, I'll, I'll look into it. And so one of the first areas of interest that I had for this grant was uh, researching the Hanseatic League which is essentially a German federation of traders that had a network of trade routes along the coast of Europe, branching up into Scandinavia, England, and into the various river cities in Europe, down the Danube and into places like Poland, Estonia. When studying the Hanseatic League, then I asked myself, what gave the Hanseatic League the idea to travel so boldly uh, throughout the region of Europe and along the coast? So this is late Middle Ages. It then took me into the topic of the Vikings. And I remembered from a Institute of Russian study that we had at Valencia in 2012, the Vikings had traveled by river in addition to all of the things we hear about in America. Uh, you know, the Vikings coming to Newfoundland and we find settlements or we find things that they left behind. Uh, we hear about the raids of these pagans on the cathedrals in England and France. But I remember this one detail of this, this network of trade that the Vikings had set up and a network of, of raids, essentially, a, a headquarters for raiding on a river in Europe. And I went back to that and I started reading and ended up learning a new perspective on just the trade routes and the breadth of travel that was going on in arguably what was still the Dark Ages. Uh, we like to think that the Dark Ages were not a period of advanced technologies or it was feudalism and warlords, which it was, but we also like to think of the sort of isolated cultures and people not interacting and living in fear and not going over the hill uh, just on, the, on that side of the horizon. It turns out that people were traveling quite extensively in this time period, which where we're going to narrow in is the ninth century, roughly the mid ninth century, the 850s, 860s. When you look at Vikings, Scandinavian Vikings are not all the same people. Norwegian Vikings raided and explored different regions than say Danish Vikings. And in this case with the Swedish Vikings, they're the ones specifically responsible for exploring the rivers that run through Russia and down into what is modern day Ukraine, into the Caspian and the Black Seas. Uh, primarily what we're gonna look at is the attacks on Constantinople and what came as a result of attacking Constantinople. The early Viking groups that started exploring these river systems, uh, definitely using smaller ships than the normal Viking longships that we, we think of. You know, some of these Viking ships had 60 oars, sails that could get them across the Atlantic. They did not sail directly across the Atlantic. They would hop land masses, Iceland, Greenland, Newfoundland, and down. They would explore the coast along the European seaside. Uh, they would build smaller ships so that they could navigate rivers. Especially if you think, you know, they, they waged a siege on Paris in the ninth century. You can't just sail a 60 oar ship that's, you know, 70, 80 feet long down these rivers. It might have shallower spots. You need smaller ships. And so uh, river travel is something that they were experts in just as much as ocean travel. When they attacked Constantinople, the Vikings are, well, in, in any of, of the attacks in general, the Vikings are kind of portrayed as these pagan raiders that, you know, just kind of roll in, bust everything up, light everything on fire, uh, kill lots of people and take what they want and they leave. Yes, they begin that way. There are areas of difficulty with this assumption or stereotype of the Vikings. When they attack, say, Ireland, 
yes, they roll in, they light things on fire, they, you know, have quite a, a siege, and they take everything that's pretty much shiny or of value, or maybe even slaves, and they go home. With the river exploration, it's a little bit more complicated than that. When they first started traveling down these rivers, uh, initially they have a raid, and initially they are going to just see what they can do to the local tribes the further south they go. So the Vikings are going to, for instance, find some tribes and say, give us some furs, give us some wealth of any sort, honey, wax, furs, uh, you know, any sort of jewelry, precious stones. And if they surrender these things, maybe they could survive. But the Vikings might also, you know, simply attack them and take these things as a result as well. As they are moving further south, these tribes realize that there is an organization to these Swedish Vikings known as the Varangians. Uh, they are also known as the, the Rus. Uh, these Vikings did not call themselves Vikings, but the Rus are going through modern day Russia. And so when we say the word Rosa or Rosia, this is Russia. This is the origin of the term. So it wasn't necessarily the Slavic tribes or the Bulgars or the Khazars in Russia that lead to modern day Russia's name, but it's actually people from Sweden that are exploring the region and leaving their influence behind and actually offering protection and organization of law in the region as they conquer it. Cities like Kiev in Ukraine, Novgorod, these are cities in the modern day that actually have Viking roots in terms of what gets these cities going and becoming official trade centers or areas that have some sort of order and civilization in them and are uniting tribes of people. When the Vikings attack Constantinople, obviously it's this massive city, it has an emperor, it has churches, it's ripe for the picking. When they attack it in the ninth century, the first attack, it consists of about 8,000 Vikings, all going on these smaller ships, who just happen to attack it on a Sunday when the emperor and all of his troops are conveniently in an army battle somewhere, in a battle somewhere else. The townspeople, well, they happen to be in church. The patriarch of one of these churches named Photius is explaining to these uh, Byzantines, well, this must be our sins. I mean, who are these people? They're not Christians, they're strange looking, they're showing up and, and there's, there's havoc being re uh, wreaked upon the city. A description by Photius actually gives a wonderful account of what these Viking attacks were like. Photius lays out this incredibly graphic scene that illustrates not just how Vikings attacked, but how everyone in the, in the medieval world would have waged an attack on a city. He writes, a nation dwelling somewhere far from our country, barbarous, nomadic, armed with arrogance, unwatched, unchallenging, leaderless, has suddenly in the twinkling of an eye, like a wave of the sea, poured over our frontiers, and as a wild boar has devoured the inhabitants of the land, like grass or straw or crop, sparing nothing from man to beast, not respecting the hoary hairs of old men, softened by nothing that is wont to move human nature to pity, even when it has sunk to that of wild beasts, but boldly thrusting their sword through persons of every age and sex, Infants were torn away from breast and milk and life itself, and their bodies were dashed against the rocks, which became their graves. Their mothers were slaughtered and thrown upon the still convulsing bodies of their infants. Nor did their savagery stop with human beings, but was extended to dumb animals, oxen, horses, fowl, and others. There lay an ox and a man by its side, a child and a horse found a common grave. Woman and fowl stained each other with their blood. Everywhere, dead bodies. You know, the Vikings are, have carried a stereotype for centuries that they are the ones waging such attacks. But in the world at this time, in Europe, this is every violent attack. The Vikings attack Constantinople successfully once. The Byzantine Empire is an, it's a force to be reckoned with. Over time, especially after a few other unsuccessful attacks and defeats, Constantinople and the Viking leaders essentially come up to an agreement that maybe it's in the best of everyone's interest, interest to trade. What ends up happening is that the emperor of Constant, Constantinople at the time, because of his regional in, influences amongst other tribes and groups of people, when the Vikings were attacking, he could just send his alliances after them. He could squash them. 
He also had advanced technology such as Greek fire, so that if the Vikings wanted to wage a naval battle, even if they outnumbered them in ships, the Byzantines had a what is essentially napalm uh, that they could squirt while on fire onto the ships and onto the Vikings that were attacking. And this stuff is not uh, you know, extinguished by water. They have to jump in the water and it's still burning. So the Vikings are just absolutely devastated with attacks on Constantinople. It's a far different account or story or result than when we hear about the raids on England or France or Ireland. Over time, through these trade alliances that we hear about, Constantinople was able to introduce the Vikings to different groups and cultures that had access to desirable goods. So that whole trade relationship or that, that dominance of this river system over these other tribes that lived along the rivers, Slavs, Finns, Bulgars, the Vikings developed a system of trade, but if there wasn't trade in the various times of the year when they couldn't travel on the river, they would collect tribute. They would then, in turn, bring these tribute goods, such as furs, honeys, wax, uh, down Constantinople for trade. The Byzantines didn't necessarily trust the Vikings, but these traders were allowed, for instance, in the city 50 at a time through one gate, no weapons. Uh, Constantinople definitely knew these, you know, the brutes they were dealing with, but they were allowed to come into the city, they were allowed to trade, uh, they were not allowed to talk to for instance, local women, uh, you know, don't get too comfortable here. Get out of here once you've acquired the goods that you want and be on your way. But again, the trade alliances with Constantinople allow the Vikings to trade with cultures east of Constantinople. And one of the trade developments that's very interesting that, that uh, occurs is that Vikings not only start taking their boats down into the Black Sea, but start in, taking a different river into the Caspian Sea. And when going into the Caspian Sea, they will then pack their trade goods onto the backs of camels and go as far as Baghdad. Now, why would Vikings of the 9th century want to go to modern day Iraq? The main desire of all of the, these trading goods is the accumulation of silver, which is not an indigenous precious metal in Scandinavia. There is none of it. Arabic cultures, Islamic cultures at the time, happen to have access to quite a bit. They also have highly advanced grades of steel for better weaponry. The Vikings had at one point tried to go down to Sevilla in Spain and try to raid Islamically led cities in Spain. Again, the Arab world had advanced military tactics and they were able to defend themselves adequately. So instead, using their connections through Constantinople, they were able to generate enough trade agreements, uh, they were able to learn about enough markets where they could go and trade their goods. And actually one of the most uh, vivid accounts of the Viking people and what these traders were like uh, is by an Islamic trader named Ibn Fadlan. Uh, describes the Vikings as wearing uh, baggy trousers, always leaving one arm exposed uh, so they could draw a weapon. Bearded, tattooed all over, all over the faces with you know things like trees and dogs and cats and strange uh, forest animals or plants or mythological symbols. As traders, the Vikings are pretty interesting. They would set up idols and pray to their idols that they would you know have a good day in sales. When the sales were slow, they would maybe go back to these idols and they would pray some more. If they sold some things, they would run back to the idols and pray to them as well. Uh, this is prior to the Viking adaptation of Christianity. Ibn Fadlan is uh, one of the most uh, interesting accounts from the Islamic world about what the Vikings were like in terms of their burial practices as well. Uh, describes a, a ship burial. Uh, the Vikings, when their friends would get sick, and you have to think they're quite a ways from home. When the Vikings would get sick, they would give their friend bread and water, put him in a room by himself and quarantine him. If he made it, he made it, he lived. If he didn't, then they would have uh, quite the party based on his possessions, splitting them up in three ways. They would leave a third of his treasure hoard in the grave with him. They would give a third of it to his family and they would spend a third of it for themselves on having a giant party, on sending their friend up to Valhalla to you know, drink mead with the gods. The way that they would have the funeral is lay their friend in the boat or you know, in a grave surrounded by his goods, as well as a few animals, uh, you know, chickens, oxen, pigs. They would sacrifice these animals with them as well, sometimes also a slave to take to the afterlife. And of course their money or treasure, and they would light this funeral pyre on fire and they would 
essentially get drunk. When Ibn Fadlan witnesses a funeral, the Vikings actually question him. They say, you know, what, what's up with this burying of bodies? You guys, you know, in the Islamic world, in the Christian world, you, you bury bodies so that your friends can be eaten by worms. We light them on fire, so they just right away go to paradise. It's an interesting account. It's also one of the most, the only direct accounts with Vikings, interactions and discussions. What's interesting though with the Islamic world is that at this time, ninth century, we have a collection of uh, groups. We have various groups trading through the Mediterranean, Middle East, and with the, the Asian or the Eurasian world. We've heard of the Silk Road perhaps, and the Silk Road dates back to one or two centuries BC. This is how the uh, Chinese dynasties were actually trading silk with the ancient Romans. We rarely learn anything about this in the American curriculum of European history. It's very interesting how European and Asian cultures uh, overlap for centuries, almost sort of like this Venn diagram. And we rarely hear about, for instance, the cultural histories of Russia or the various cultures that are in that Eurasian overlap area. We hear about the Asian, we hear about European, but we have this rich history of the Eurasian cultures and the Silk Road being in full operation in the ninth century. So Ibn Fadlan is obviously is a trader, an Islamic trader, working on these networks of the Silk Road and the Middle East, interacting with Vikings from Scandinavia. A few interesting objects have been found that illustrate the breadth of Viking travel and just the directions so many things were coming from that were being exchanged and taken back home. In a small region of Sweden on an island called Helgo Island, there was a archeological dig back in the early 50s, I believe. And in one dig near what was a, what they believed to be a metal smithing shop, the Helgo treasure was discovered. It consists of three main items. It consists of a Buddha statue. It's a reliquary that scholars of Asian culture have been able to track back to a area in Pakistan, just above India, and just by comparing it to other Buddha statues. Now how does a statue end up all the way in Scandinavia? And we cannot make any conclusions, for instance, that the Vikings went to Pakistan. It's, it's difficult to even make a, a supported argument that they made it all the way to Baghdad. We know they were close, we know they were in the region, but they didn't write these things down. They didn't have roadmaps, for instance. They were simply looking to trade, traded it, and took the, their wealth home, or took it elsewhere to trade. But we have this small Buddha statue that is believed to have been a reliquary, that by the time that a Viking was getting this object back to Sweden, was already centuries old. Archaeologists can make no conclusions about it having any religious significance for the Vikings. There's been stories, maybe the Vikings, you know, when they traveled to different regions, adopted the gods of others. There's nothing supporting this. The only evidence as to why this thing ended up in Sweden, why it was in a blacksmith shop, is because it's a bronze figure with copper and silver inlays. Maybe, because it's near a smithing shop, someone was actually interested in its, in its design and its construction and studying how these metals could be smithed together. Another interesting find is a bishop's crozier from where they think is from Northern Ireland or some of the British Isles. The bishop's crozier is, if you look at it closely, this is a fish that is consuming or ejecting a person is believed to be a depiction of the biblical figure Jonah. And when I say Bishop's Crozier, I mean this is the little ornament on the top of the staff carried by a bishop, a Christian bishop of the time. Some folks doubt that this is actually a Crozier just due to its size and maybe say this is the, this thing is remarkably similar to the finials that decorate the back of chairs seen in illuminated manuscripts from this era as well, where the evangelists sitting in these chairs are sitting in a chair with a finial of this kind. If you look at this image of the Book of Kells, uh, we see an illuminated manuscript image. And if you look where that little figure of Mary is sitting on the back of the chair, you'll see the finial. And that is another hypothesis for what this object actually is. And the third item found of, of significant interest is a Coptic ladle. The Coptic ladle is coming from the region of Egypt, Ethiopia. 
And so just in these three objects found in one archeological dig in one specific spot, we see travel that reaches as far east as Pakistan, as far west as Ireland or Britain, and as far south as Egypt. This is incredibly surprising when you think about the characterization that we make for the Dark Ages, an era of paranoia, an era of feudal warlords that fight over territory with one another, an era where peasants have no idea what lives beyond the hills on the out, you know, outside of their village. They're not allowed to marry anyone that lives outside of their feudal territory. So, you know, it sounded like just the Crusades were the first examples of cultural diffusion in the Middle East, but the Crusades happened three centuries later. The interesting aspect, the conclusion we can make is that these travel routes essentially thrived throughout the Dark Ages. In fact, if the travel routes of the Silk Road were going on, uh, you know, were taking silk to Rome as late as the third century AD, we can assume that maybe during the fall of Rome, trade slows down, but international travel at this time is, is quite impressive.